Welcome to the Millionaire Next Door podcast with Robert Curtis, CFP, accredited investment fiduciary from Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. In this podcast, we help successful wealth accumulators like you looking to transition to a work optional lifestyle by helping you build strategies for growing and maintaining your wealth. Robert draws from years of experience and fiduciary responsibility and interviews guest experts to help you build reliable strategies to grow and maintain your wealth. Now, on to the show. The year 2023 brings a lot of changes that can impact your financial planning for retirement. I'm Patrice Sikora with your host, Robert Curtis. Now, Robert, Many of these changes are tied to the Secure 2.0 Act. What is that? <laughs> yes, good, good question, Patrice. Uh, so Secure 2.0, there was a, a bill and legislation that was passed and signed into law uh, during the holidays in dis- late December of 2022, right between Christmas, say the, the holidays and New Year's, it is uh, Secure 2.0 it, of 2022. It builds upon improvements made by the Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act. That, that's quite a mouthful, right? <laughs> but like like government, but there's a, a huge an acronym. But that's what Secure Act is of 2019. Uh, the new one was some sort of cleanup and expansion, but there's 90, there's about 90 changes in this. Um, it's about a 1200 page bill. I've actually been on numerous uh, calls and discussions with people who've literally read every one of the 1200 pages. I'm not going to go through every one of the 1200 pages or Thank all the 90 provisions. Thank you for that. Yes. yes. I know. I, I really <laughs> like and respect our audience's time, so I don't want to um, go through all that. But um, there are some major provisions that affect IRAs, SIMPLES, SEPs, 529 plans, qualified retirement plans like 401ks, et cetera. So I wanted to go over some highlights and the bill phases in. There's some things effective immediately in 2023, and there's some that'll come in over you know the next couple of years, 2024, 2025. So I thought we'd future pace a little bit of that, but there, there's some pretty interesting changes you know, for I like mm-hmm. to think for our audience and certainly for our clients, just restressing the millionaire next door, the overnight 25 year success story. If you're sort of building this thing year by year over many years, there's some subtle changes here that actually are pretty positive collectively and should help people to save up for uh, larger retirement nest eggs, defer taxation. And we think overall that'll be a good thing. So wanted to go over a few of the, the big highlights. Just so where would, you like to start? where would you like to start taking money out or putting money in? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I mentioned in a prior podcast, a number of the contribution limits have been raised. So that's sort of a normal process that flows, uh, especially since we saw inflation. Some of these numbers jumped up. 401ks and 403bs, uh, 22500 is the max now for, for 2023 catch-up provisions, and I'll be referring back to this quite a bit throughout the podcast, but those are now an additional $7,500 if one is age 50 or older. Uh, What's called a defined contribution, you you can now, that's moved from $61,000 to $66,000. We have a lot of business owners who do that in addition to defined benefit plans, plus they can do the catch-ups. IRA limits are at $6,500. Uh, IRA catch-up limits are at 1000 So these amounts have gone up. But let me jump to the SECURE Act, what really changed, what they did. So interestingly, the SECURE Act of 2019 increased the required minimum distribution age uh, from 70 and a half to 72. So we view that as a positive, and we had to educate a lot of clients, and we have a lot of people taking these RMDs. So if you're already taking them, this these changes don't matter that much on that. But for people who haven't started, the SECURE Act, the 2.0, just approved the age at which required minimum distributions must begin has increased from 72 to 73, beginning January 1, 2023. And it'll increase to age 75 in 2033. 
So what that means is those born before 1951, th there's really no impact. Uh, if you're born between 1951 and 1959, the age is pushed back to 73. You get another another year you can put into these things mm -hmm. and another year you could defer out that taxation. If for people born in 1960 or after, the RMD age is pushed back to 75. That's an additional like three years over it was, but it was, it's really was not that long ago. It was 70 and a half. So four and a half years yeah. it can be a pretty big deal. Just letting people know that also another, another, just a aspect to note, we, we work with many, many folks taking these RMDs and we're, we spend a lot of December just making sure everybody's taking their RMD and nobody misses an RMD because that's like this really big foul that feels feels horrible. We've never missed an RMD. I'm, I'm knocking on wood wow. visibly so our, our listeners can hear. But if one does miss an RMD, prior to this, the penalty was 50%. That's what the I and it's one of the most punitive in the entire tax code. And that's that's just to send a really strong message. They're giving you tax deferral and then, but they, they want their revenue. If you miss it, they, they you know, they're going to make you feel it. They've reduced that through the secure act to 25%. I mean, again, we don't really see it that much, but they've cut it in half. And if, if an untaken RMD from a qualified plan or IRA is corrected in a timely manner that the taxes act actually reduced to 10%. So they've just made it much less punitive if you forget to take it. That is a huge um, difference. Fifty percent down to ten percent. Yeah, that's, that's giant. And I, I should say we've we've never missed it. I've I've seen a few people that have uh, in more extreme cases, and this is really extreme. A woman I worked with years and years and years ago had lost her husband, and she she really kind of went in, off the deep end into a severe depression and. Um, Anyway, she sort of stopped dealing with stuff for about seven years, didn't pay taxes at all, didn't mm -hmm. take RMDs. I mean, really just neglected everything. And she was so, so distraught and what a pretty extreme case. At any rate, the point of the story is through a really good CPA, they were able to write a letter. They were able to work with the authorities, explain there was this, this situation yeah. Got it all waived the penalties. I mean, she had to pay. She had to and take all those RMDs. I think my understanding in the end, and you should talk to a CPA and whatnot. I mean, if they just want to collect what's owed, they're not right. really there to penalize you. They want to put those teeth in there. Uh, but they were able to get that waived due to those circumstances because she just didn't deal. Her brain just couldn't process it. But right. so at any rate, that's that's a little bit on the aside. So. We think it'll be really good that these RMDs have been pushed back because, again, longer tax deferral. You know, we're dealing with investment time horizons. It gives a longer time horizon for folks. Uh, a lot of the folks we deal with, good majority, don't even really need the RMD per se. They're just required to take it, and that comes into taxable income. So if they can defer that, that that's a good thing. Uh, other folks do need it. I mean, that's a major source of their income. So they're, they're ready for it. But a lot of people sort of would, you know, maybe they have a pension, they have other savings, they don't really want the income, they're just required to take it. So so that'll be good. We could be looking at a bigger tax crunch down the line, though, ultimately. So now if you push it out to age 75, and you're taking out a larger amount over fewer years, gotcha. that could be larger tax. So but you know, that's, that's years down the line. So that's a big provision. Let me discuss a couple other big change or substantial changes for people to be aware of. Within 401k plans several years ago, they permitted also called a Roth 401k, uh, where where you wouldn't take a deduction, but if that better served you, uh, it's like it's Roth, so it's never never taxed. No RMD is required. This for the the Secure Act of 2.0 just starting this year. Simple plans, S-I-M-P-L-E, and also SEP IRAs, this is often used by self-employed people, they can now have a Roth, a Roth characteristic to it. So employers are now able to, able to offer Roth simple and uh, SEP IRAs alongside traditional simple and, and you know, uh, SEP. So 
That's that's kind of cool. We work with a lot of folks where that comes up in discussion. Would be would they be better off going with a Roth qualified plan or a you know or taking the deduction? That's that's a more detailed discussion. But this gives additional flexibility. What about catch up limits? I think they changed, didn't they? The catch up limits. I'm just about to get into that right now. Mm-hmm. That, so a really interesting provision. They they've made some higher catch-up limits for folks that are age 60, 61, 62, and 63. Uh, I guess the thinking is, as you approach, you know, that's common that people are starting to sort of lever up right before retirement. Mm -hmm. Maybe they retire at 65, 63. Maybe there's a chance to sort of super fund this or put more in. So they've created this window where there's an additional four years where the catch-up limits are substantially increased. So for 2022, you know, I mentioned um, the limit on catch-ups is $7,500, except in the case of simple plans where it's $3,000. This section um, increases these limits to the greater of $10,000, so 50% more than the regular catch-up amount is starting in 2025 uh, for individuals who have attained ages 60, 61, 62, and 63. And these amounts are indexed for inflation too after 2025. Mm. So they'll probably be even more. So again, the the it's measures in effect for taxable years beginning December 31, 2024. So really 2025. But it's a nice little window. And, and we're future pacing it because people uh, will be able to ramp that up in those years. And often those years, 60, 63, you're probably... A lot of folks are at the highest earning they've ever been at, right? They're further along in their career. They might be topping out on the and and in greater need of a deduction. So it's kind of an interesting window there. That's fantastic. That's again, some big changes there, big amount changes. Yeah, these these all these things stacked together are, I think, are a, a big plus for folks. So I just want to let them know they're out there. And we're thinking about them. And if you hear about them and you don't have to go read 1200 pages in the bill, <laughs> but there's, yeah, here's another provision that's kind of interesting. 529 plans can, uh, if there's, these are these college savings plans that I, I equate them a lot like a Roth IRA. It's for college savings versus retirement, but you know, they grow up and they're tax free forever, as long as they're used for qualified education purposes. Now what they've said, if there's excess funds in a college savings account uh, after they're done with that, that, a portion of that can be rolled into a Roth IRA. So it can sort of be shifted over toward a retirement purpose. So maybe you have someone in their late 20s, early 30s, they've kind of super funded their retirement. That's pretty cool. The section amends the Internal Revenue Code to allow for tax and penalty-free rollovers from 529 accounts to Roth IRAs under certain conditions. So before you get too excited, (laughs) uh, let me explain some of the conditions. So beneficiaries of the 529 college savings accounts would be permitted to roll over up to $35,000 over the course of their lifetime from any 529 into a, uh, an IRA. So the, the, we do see, I, you know, 529s that are up in six, you know, sure. four or 500,000. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you could do all that, but, you know, up to 35, um, that's over the course of their lifetime. The, the subject to the limits of that would go into a Roth IRA in a given year. So $6,500 per year. It, like if you were just contributing to a Roth, you could only do 6,500. You also have to have compensation. So if that um, student or former student, if they made, they'd have to make at least $6,500 a year in income to be able to do $6,500. If they only made $1,500, they could only do $1,500. But they, they could keep doing it in future years. That's, that's how a Roth works too. But but they're trying to expand this to let that be, a um, it's really like a tax-free rollover into a different purpose. Um, what else can I tell you? The, these 529s must have been maintained for at least 15 years or longer. And that may sound like a long time, but you know, a lot of folks have these for, mm-hmm. if, you know, if the, they started when they're born and are the kids 15 or 20, they've been in existence for 15 years. 
contributions made within the last five years and those earnings are not eligible. But this is just an interesting provision. I have a lot of folks where, um, you know, some folks are pulling it all down and, you know, I'm doing it. I have a son in college right now, you know, we're pulling down as 529 and we'll probably go through that number. But, <laughs> that's, but what it's it's, for. that's what it's, it's there neat for. to know if we did have excess and I have clients that do that, that could be rolled over into their Roth IRA. Uh, let me let me jump into a few other provisions that are in there. We're just future pacing some of this stuff. There's a significant expansion of startup plan tax credits uh, starting in 2023. Uh, we talked about, we had a prior podcast with Kevin Manahan from CMC Pensions. They're a third party actuary. They set up 401k plans. You might be able to reference that in the the show, show notes. notes. Sure. He talked about uh, uh, some plan credits that that current plan sponsors can get for setting up retirement plans, which offsets a lot of the costs, which is pretty cool. Um, they've expanded that really for startups. So the Secure Act substantially expanded the startup plan tax credit for certain plan costs paid by the employers, such as what are called record keeping fees third-party administrators, financial professional expenses, et cetera, by removing its percentage limitation uh, for certain smaller employers and, and even more significantly created a new tax credit that reimburses small businesses for a portion of their amount um, of employer contributions made. The, cr the credit starts at 100% of employer contributions made for each employee earning less than 100000 a year up to $1,000 in phases down over five years. So I won't get too into the details, um, but together these two credits could make plan adoption extremely cost-effective if there's employers out there looking at it. You can talk to me about it. We can put you in touch with a, a really good third-party administrator like uh, you know, CMC or, or others in a certain area. But that's, that's a, another plus that's come in. A uh, few other provisions to touch on uh, the, the SECURE Act expands automatic enrollment in retirement plans. And I want to stress that this is for new plans only starting in 2024, but they're going to require some automatic enrollment, make everyone go in unless they opt out. So they're emphasizing these. And um, you know, a lot of people just don't do it. They don't take the payroll deduction, but they're going to be required. This will be the default if they don't make a decision. So it requires 401k and 403 plans to automatically enroll participants in respective plans upon becoming eligible. And again, the employees can opt out if they don't want it, but otherwise they're going to default in. And we find a lot of the reason they don't go in in the first place, a lot of times it's just, uh, I don't want to call it laziness, but it's just, they just don't do it. They don't mm -hmm. fill out the paperwork. They don't take the time. It's kind of an inertia thing, but if they're already in it, then they're in it, they like it, and they see their retirement nest egg growing. The initial automatic enrollment amount is at least 3%, but not more than 10%. Each year thereafter, that amount is increased by 1% until it reaches at least 10%, but not more than 15%. So I do want to emphasize existing plans are grandfathered. So if you're running a plan, don't, don't feel you have to deal with this, but for new plans, they, they want to get a new generation of folks all saving for retirement. Who sets whether or not it's 3%, but not more than 10%? Is it the employer? Probably the employer. Yeah. And th this is actually not even in effect till 2024. So we don't exactly know, but just, just sort of future pacing some of these things that are to come sure. up and to think about. And, it, you know, you'd probably be working with a third party administrator who could lay it out exactly. Yeah. But that could that might be an employer thing, depending upon how strongly they felt. Maybe they meet they do the minimum. I made thinking, you know what? Put away ten percent. Um, again, at the thematically, the podcast, the millionaire next door. I see a lot of really large rollovers. You know, sometimes in the high six and seven figures, where they were making good wages, um, but it was over thirty years, and now it's you know it's a seven figure account. It takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day kind of thing. So <laughs> oh, here's another interesting one. Uh, beginning in 2024, catch-up contributions. We talked about these catch-up contributions for folks over 50. 
to qualified retirement plans like a 403B, a 401k, -hmm. et cetera, for higher income earners are required to be Roth after-tax contributions, even if regular contributions are pre-tax. So participants with compensation below $145,000, and this is adjusted up for inflation as well, they're exempt and they can elect uh, pre-tax or Roth catch-up contributions. But if you're making more than $145,000, that catch-up contribution is going to need to be a Roth. Interesting. So it, it is interesting. And I'll tell you, we had a, we had a situation I thought of that was just like this. Um, just a few weeks ago, a um, client of mine who's in a 401k plan, he he's an attorney, he's with a law firm. His HR department was asking, do you want your next year's contributions to be um, to be Roth or non-Roth. And he actually turns 50 this year. So um, he had to make an election. And then we, that's sort of a tax question. So we we brought his CPA into it and said, you're really in just the highest tax bracket. So we wouldn't, um, you know, Roth, there's a lot of great advantages to Roth, but you could really use the deduction. So for this year, he's going to take both and and take the deduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, once this provision kicks in in uh, two hundred two four, he won't have a choice on that. He makes way more than one hundred forty five thousand dollars. So his catch up contribution, right, that seventy five hundred dollars, is going to have to be Roth, and it, that choice is good. Now there's some benefits to Roth for sure. Those are not later subject to RMD. That'll never be taxed, but. That's seventy five hundred dollars. He won't be able to take a deduction for. Apparently, they needed to, or felt they needed to pay for some of these other uh, right. tax provisions <laughs> through something. So, yeah. But um, those are just some of the real highlights that I thought would be of most interest to the folks we deal with on a regular basis. So, um, just wanted to give a little future pacing. Let folks know. Let me know if you have questions. Um, Personally, I mean, I do all this stuff myself. I eat my own cooking. I'm excited that the RMD age is going to be pushed out to 75 because done the right way, there's, um, I think that opens up definite opportunities for larger wealth creation over time right. and larger deductions over time. Yeah. So, well, Robert, how can people reach you? Well, very good, Patrice. All, all the normal ways. Uh, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, I would say probably easiest just to email me, rcurtis, C-U-R-T-I-S-S at S-E-I-A.com. You can call my office as well. You you can easily find me uh, on my firm's website, Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. I also have several videos, um, and I think our prior podcasts have, you know, in the show notes, how to, how to reach me. I, I, we were talking real quick. I want to tell you right before that the in, most interesting way someone's ever reached me. Uh, I was on a hike recently in the local mountains after a lot of rains, and it was a beautiful day where the sun had come out. At any rate, must have passed 150 people. Didn't interact with interact with anyone. I happened to say like two or, two or three words and talk for maybe 20 seconds to a woman who was on the, out on this remote hike. She says to me. Are you that podcast guy? <laughs> I I could not believe it. So um, we had not talked very long, but the answer was yes. I asked. She'd listened to all the podcasts. She's a self-employed. Um, I couldn't believe that. So it gave me a lot of um, inspiration that people are listening. A shout out to her. So if somebody does want to get in touch, we love our community. Welcome to 2023. Just wanted to give you a few tax law. Uh, changes that that should be uh, beneficial. We'll keep you updated. This is pretty pretty breaking news. But with the twelve hundred page uh, document, we just want to break through, uh, break down a few of the highlights there. Well, all you listeners, you can follow this podcast guy to know when the latest episode of his podcast is ready for you, and of course, share with others. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to the Millionaire Next Door podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Signature Estate and Investment Advisors or Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. 
The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.